Hello, this is Domenico Composto, and today we will illustrate a model from Theory of the Firm. We're going to be looking at perfect competition. And first, to provide a real-world example for the model um, that we'll be illustrating, uh, let's look at the global market of coffee. So here we have data over a 13-year period of the volatility of coffee prices over time. And we'll notice that in 2010, the price of coffee uh, went from $1.33 and it jumped up to almost $3, right? $2.96, and then it collapses again. So perfect, perfectly competitive market structures as a theoretical model helps us understand what's happening within the primary commodity market. These are uh, inputs that are directly extracted from the land. It can be timber, aluminum, copper, gold, coffee, wheat, barley, rice. And we'll notice that in that market structure, the price of those uh, primary commodities are very volatile. So let's go ahead and illustrate the global market for coffee between that period to understand why the price rose and then fell. So we'll first, first look at one uh, we'll label this our first scenario. Scenario number one, where we are looking at a perfectly competitive market structure. Okay. And in this scenario, we're going to assume that we're going to start at uh, normal profit. The firm will start at normal profit. Then it will go to super normal profit. And then it will collapse down again in the long run to normal profit. And in this case, it's going to be driven by an increase in demand. And then later we'll see that this will result in an increase in supply. So this is our first scenario. We'll be looking at the global market for coffee. For coffee, okay. So first we have two graphs. We need two graphs to illustrate this. The first graph will be the industry. And the second graph will be the individual firm. Now we're just looking at one coffee producer. We can call this graph A, graph B, the industry, and the firm. On the industry, we're going to be measuring price. And quantity. And with the firm, we'll be looking at price, also the costs of production, and also their revenue. And again, we'll be measuring quantity on the x-axis. So the industry, we first illustrate this, and the industry has an upward sloping supply curve according to the law of supply, we have a downward sloping demand curve according to the law of demand. And the equilibrium where S1 equals D1, it sets an equilibrium price in the free market at P1 and equilibrium quantity supplied and demanded at Q1. All right, so that'll be our first point. We'll label that point A, okay? the market or the global market for coffee is set by the collective number of coffee farmers all the farmers collectively becoming part of the supply curve and then we have all of the uh, coffee roasters and producers that are demanding coffee as an input so that it can be packaged and sold to consumers or to retailers so the equilibrium sets that price and that price as we'll see becomes the price that the individual firm must accept. Okay. The firm is a price taker. There are millions of coffee farmers worldwide 
no one farmer has the ability to influence price. They are so small and insignificant compared to the millions of other of, uh, coffee producers. So they are a price taker. So that sets the price at P1 that the firm must accept. And we'll notice that price is equal to the average revenue for the individual firm, which is also equal to the marginal revenue for the firm. And price equals AR, and AR is our demand curve, which is also equal to our marginal benefit curve for the individual firm. The individual firm supply curve, let's use another color, uh, has this shape due to the law of diminishing marginal returns. So here is the supply curve for the individual firm. We'll label that S1, which is also equal to our marginal cost curve. And we'll assume that they're starting at normal profit. So here's their ATC curve intersecting with MC at its lowest point and then rising, we'll call that the average total costs, okay? So here the firm is producing also at this point, right? and I guess I'll call that the, that uh, point A. Within this market structure, we assume profit maximization, and profit maximization, profit max, is at, uh, MR equals MC, where the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. There, the firm has maximized their profit. So here's the MR curve, and it's intersecting with the supply curve, MC, at point A. So that sets quantity for the individual firm at Q1. Okay? So we noticed right at the beginning of this video that uh, we were looking at global coffee prices, and uh, I believe it was... Uh, 2010 or so, there was a dramatic rise in the uh, price of coffee. This was a result in part of the Nespresso machine being introduced and sold. And lots of consumers bought that machine. There was an increase in the consumption of coffee at home. And so that caused the demand for coffee to rise. Consumers are demanding coffee and then Nespresso as a company is demanding more coffee. So we notice that in the industry, Nespresso is demanding more coffee. So we see that demand for the industry has increased from D1 to D2. As a result of that increase in demand, we see an increase in the quantity of supply by all of these individual coffee farmers to meet the increased demand by perhaps Nespresso as a company. And that leads to a rise in price at P2 within the industry increasing the quantity supplied and demanded to Q2, okay? So now we're at point B. And that new equilibrium between S1 and D1 sets a new price that the firm must accept. So that price comes all the way across. Price for the firm has risen from P1 to P2. And we notice that P2 is equal to the average revenue, AR2, which is equal to MR2, which is equal to demand, 2 equal to marginal benefit, 2. So the firm wants the profit maximized, so they're going to increase their quantity supplied due to the increase in the demand or increase in the price. They're going to increase the quantity supplied along their supply curve and will profit maximize where MR, again, MR equals MC, right, at this point, at point B. So the quantity supplied is increased from Q1 to Q2. All right. So at this point, at Q2, we notice that the firm is now making super normal profit because the average revenue here, AR, is greater than ATC. So here's ATC. We'll label that costs. Uh, of production at two costs two, which is a T C two. So here, average revenue is greater than average total costs. So this firm is earning abnormal or super normal profit. Okay. So this rectangle right here that I'm coloring in green is the super normal profit. What happens? The super normal profit 
begins to attract other farmers into the coffee production industry. Perhaps you have a farmer that's producing, um, let's just make it up, wheat. And then they notice that their next door neighbor who produces coffee is making good money because times are good, demand has increased in the industry, price has gone up, and now the individual farmer is making a good sizable profit. So the farmer that's producing wheat is going to switch. They're going to switch away from wheat and get into the coffee production business because times are good in that industry. So as more and more farmers globally begin to enter the industry, because here we're assuming low to no barriers of entry, more and more farmers join. And in the industry, the collective number, the aggregate number of additional farmers coming into industry increases the global supply. All of these farmers are coming in and they begin to collectively increase the global supply. So the global supply increases from S1 to S2. As a result of the increase in supply, we notice that the, um, that the price has fallen from P2 back to P1. And because of the fallen price, the quantity demanded by Nespresso as a firm demanding coffee is increasing due to the lower price. And we reach a new equilibrium at point C. All right, so the quantity supply and demand it increases again to Q3. Well, what happens? Since the industry sets the, the price that the firm must take, the industry has lowered price from P2 to P1. And for the firm, price has fallen from P2 to P1. As a result of the fall in the price, the, let's see if we can choose another color, the individual firm has to decrease. They have to decrease the quantity supply because price has fallen. Price is going down, so the firm begins to decrease the quantity supplied from Q2 to Q1. They're at point A. At point A, we notice that the average revenue is equal to their average total costs, um, and they're back at normal profit. As they reduce their quantity supplied, this farmer may have to fire some resources. Maybe they've hired some additional workers when they were generating super normal profit. Now they're going to have to fire labor, maybe fire land and capital, and return to normal profit. So this is how we graph and analyze this scenario of an initial increase in demand followed by an increase in supply and how the firm starts at normal profit where AR equals ATC and then the price rises, they increase their quantity supply, they're generating super normal profit that attracts more farmers into the industry, supply increases in the industry, price falls, and the individual farmer goes back to normal profit. So again, we see now what happened here. In 2010, there was an increase in demand in the industry, raising the price of coffee. Times are good for individual coffee farmers. They're generating super normal profit, but economists know that in this model, that super normal profit just attracts competition. It wakes up competition. More farmers enter the coffee industry, and collectively, they lead to the fall in its price, and the price falls back down to where we started again. So now that we can see a real world example of a rise and fall in price for coffee, let's go ahead and reanalyze the graph that we just drew. So on a paper one, an analysis would be, as can be seen, we have two graphs, a graph for the industry, a graph for the individual firm. In the industry, we're measuring quantity and price, quantity on the x-axis, price on the y-axis, and for the firm, we're measuring quantity on the x-axis, and price, costs, and revenue on the y-axis. In the industry, we have a downward sloping demand curve labeled D1, an upward sloping supply curve labeled S1, according to the laws of demand and supply. And for the individual firm, we see we have an upward sloping supply curve labeled S1, which is equal to our marginal cost curve. And we see that it intersects with the average total cost curve at its lowest point, signaling productive efficiency being achieved. In addition, we'll notice that with the firm, uh, marginal benefit equals marginal cost at point A, so it's also allocatively efficient. In the industry, where S1 equals D1 at point A, it establishes a free market price at P1 and a free market equilibrium quantity supplied and demanded at Q1. This sets the price that the firm must accept at P1. P1 is a perfectly elastic demand curve, 
that the firm must accept in terms of price, and price is equal to average revenue, which is equal to marginal revenue, which is equal to demand, which is equal to marginal benefit. The firm is assumed to profit maximize, where MR equals MC. MR equals MC at point A, that establishes quantity for the firm at Q1. Going back to the industry, let's say, for example, in the global market for coffee, Nespresso introduces the Nespresso machine. Uh, households begin to buy that machine. There is an increase in consumption of coffee by households, so Nespresso needs to increase their demand for coffee as an input to produce the capsules that are demanded by the household. So demand by Nespresso in the industry increases from D1 to D2. That establishes a new equilibrium where D2 equals S1 at point B, establishing a price at P2, so price has risen from P1 to P2, and there's an increase in the quantity of supply and demand from Q1 to Q2. This creates the perfectly elastic price that the firm must accept, which is P2. P2 is equal to AR2, equal to MR2, equal to demand2, equal to marginal benefit2. And again, assuming profit maximization, the individual coffee farmer will increase the quantity supplied from Q1 to Q2 at point B. We notice at quantity two, at Q2, that the average revenue being generated by the firm is greater than their average total costs. So the firm is generating super normal profit, which we can see in the, gr the green shaded rectangular box. Because the individual farmers are generating super normal profit, other farmers that are not producing coffee notice. They notice that their, that their neighbor who's a coffee producer is doing quite well, that times are good. So that will cause other farmers that are not producing coffee to enter the industry and begin to produce coffee. Because in this market structure, we assume no to, low to no barriers to entry. So globally, all over the world, more and more farmers are switching to coffee production. And collectively, that leads to an increase in the global supply of coffee from S1 to S2. Where S2 equals D2, that establishes a new equilibrium price at P1. We're at point C, and the quantity supply and demand has increased to Q3. That is the price that the firm must accept, which is P1. And so at that lower price, the individual farmer will have to reduce the quantity supplied from Q2 to Q1 or from point B to point A. They might have to also fire some resources, perhaps land, labor, and capital, to reduce their production and reduce their average total costs to produce at point A. And at point A, we notice that their average revenue is equal to their average total cost, so they're generating normal profit. So that would be an analysis of this graph. We can also highlight productive and allocative efficiency. The industry is always allocatively efficient. Supply equals marginal cost. Demand equals marginal benefit. At point A, it's allocatively efficient. Point B, it's allocatively efficient. Point C it is allocatively efficient. As for the individual farmer, they also produce at allocatively efficient um, levels of output. At point A, marginal benefit equals marginal cost, so that is allocatively efficient. At point B, marginal benefit is equal to marginal cost, so it's also allocatively efficient. But what about productive efficiency? Productive efficiency is where we produce at minimum ATC, which is where the MC curve intersects with the ATC curve. So point A is productively efficient. We're producing at minimum ATC. But when the firm produces at point B, we see that the average total cost has risen. It has gone up from being very productively efficient up to this point. So at quantity two, the firm is not productively efficient because the average total cost has risen above minimum. Okay, so those are some of the main points. Uh, we've analyzed the graph, we've drawn it, analyzed it, and we just highlighted in your evaluation the discussion regarding productive and allocative efficiency. Thank you so much.